We welcome you to Calvary Bible Chapel on this beautiful Lord's Day morning, and we pray God's richest blessing upon you as you sit under the ministry of His Word. Uh, I'm smiling because I have a, uh, a person who listens to us on the YouTube videos, um, and he says, you always start the videos the same, so I can't tell. Um, and uh, I just apologize. I just, uh, I, that is my prayer for you, and it is my prayer every week that um, as we sit under the ministry of your word, you will be exhorted and the Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified. You can turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, you might note here that there's been a little bit of a change in our outline. It's been quite a while since we've been back to 1 John chapter 3 and uh, I trust by the end of the message we'll be refreshed and reminded uh, I changed this part here that we're just about to study. It used to say conscious, conscience versus creator, and it didn't quite fit as I started to study it more. So we went with commandment versus conscience, and we're going to study verses 19 through 24. And I, I don't know that we're going to necessarily be able to get to any of these things this morning, but uh, uh, as we go through it, and if that's too small, you'd like to a printout of this, just let me know. I can bring you a printout of our outline. Um, Hosea, I trust. I always have to turn that on. That helps. Hosea, I trust, was a blessing to you as we studied what the love of God was. I think that um, the next study that we're going to dive into is how to love the brethren. How to love, that doesn't look right, how to love of the brethren. I'm sorry, that shouldn't, that is a typo. How to love the brethren is probably a, a better title for this morning's message. Remember that love is an act of will based upon the holy character of God. Love is not based upon feelings or emotions. It's based upon our deeds and those deeds based upon the holy character of God. So, for this morning's message, we're going to look back at the context of 1 John chapter 3. We're going to do an in-depth study on the conscience. And I really doubt we get to number three. Let's just throw it out right now. Don't, don't even think that we're going to get that far this morning. The context and the conscience. So let's turn to 1 John chapter 3. You're probably already there. I want you to see that the word love, divine love, agape love, is used in this chapter in numerous times. Verse 1, 11, 14, 16, 17, 18, and 23 Divine love, agape love, is used. Love based upon the holy character of God, agape love. I also will want you to note, as we read through this, and, and we are um, going to do that in just a moment, that starting in verse 10, there is a very specific thrust on the love of the brethren. A very specific thrust on the love of the brethren. So let's start... In verse 1 of 1 John chapter 3, remember this is our base study. Oh, um, maybe I should go back. If I was to ask you the main topic of 1 John, the word would be assurance. Assurance, and that will come up again this morning Remember that assurance is more than knowing you're saved. It's living like you're saved. Assurance is more than knowing you're saved. It's living like you're saved. And that's extremely important as we move through the book of 1 John. I don't always remind you of that. And so I just did. <laughs> okay, let's start in 1 John chapter 3. The wonderful statement, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, because of the manner of love that has been bestowed upon us, therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. You 
might remember that when the Lord Jesus was with the disciples in the boat that was being tossed to and fro, and they were scared to death, and Jesus went, said a few words, and the sea went calm. It says that the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? We have that same word, manner, here in verse 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. John is now trying to thrust upon us to consider the manner of love that God has for us. Behold what manner of love. Verse 2, Behold, or excuse me, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Because of the manner of love, divine love, agape love, we are now the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope, the hope of seeing Christ and being like him, it purifies himself even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested, Christ was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Behold, what manner of love. Whoso abideth in him sinneth not. Whoso sinneth hath not seen him, neither know him. Little children, no, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth, and we noted that um, probably a, a better word is practice. He that practice sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Behold, what manner of love. Whosoever is born of God doth not practice or doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. We went through a study on the divine nature that we all have the moment we were saved. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness, is not of God. And now this topic is brought up, neither he that loveth not his brother. I will again mention that the divine love of the brethren is the thrust of the end of this chapter. All the way from verse 10 to the rest, to verse 23, I believe, the love of the brethren, the love of the brethren, the love of the brethren. And so... What does that mean to us as Christians? Verse 11, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that, again, ye should love one another. Now, a negative example, not as Cain, <coughs> who was of that wicked one, who slew his brother, wherefore he slew him, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Ye know that ye have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby we perceive the love of God. I, 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 I didn't catch that verse... Um, it didn't make as much sense, I guess, until I started studying this week. Putting this whole chapter together, starting in verse 1, Paul, uh, Paul not, uh, not Paul, John says, Behold what manner of love. And now in verse 16, John says, Hereby perceive, the word for perceive is to know. Hereby we know the love of God. Do we? Do we know 
the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And if God, if we know that God has laid down his life for us, then what happens next? Well, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But who's... But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up the bowels of compassion for him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? I think that's an excellent question. How is it that we have the world's goods, and we see our brother has a need, and we don't have compassion? Now, are we talking about physical things here, or are we talking about spiritual things? Is it that we have everything in this world that God has for us, and shouldn't we have bowels of compassion for, for those who have needs? Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. And uh, out of this verse, we... We were in Hosea for a number of weeks and we looked at how the fact that Hosea loved not just in tongue and in word, but in deed and truth. God commanded Hosea to marry an adulterous woman. I don't even know that he liked her, but he loved her. Verse 19, hereby we know that we are of truth and shall assure our hearts before him. There's that word assurance. For if our heart condemn us, and now we get to the topic of the conscience. For if our heart condemn us, condemn us God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do things that are pleasing in his sight. This is the commandment that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. He that keepeth his commandments dwell in him, and he in him. Hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. So obviously there's no way that I can cover everything and I will be uh, very, very uh, truthful with you this morning. My heart goes to verse 20 and 21. Would you go back there? Verse 20, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. So I believe what John is saying here is uh, uh, because remember that the thrust, the end of this chapter is about the love of the brethren. And so let's ask ourselves, and we will do that a number of times through the message, does our heart condemn us the way we love one another? Or in verse 21, the positive, if our heart condemn us not. But we know from verse 20 that God is greater than our heart. Even if our heart doesn't condemn us, and that's very possible, we can still be guilty. So, very interesting study for me this week. Very excited about the conscience. And so these are the two things that I would like to try to successfully go over this morning. First of all, what is the biblical definition of a conscience? When, and, and I am taking from verse 20 and 21 that the heart means the conscience. I don't think that I'm taking too much liberty there. And I think that um, when, you know, if you were to do a word study, one of the words that the King James translators use for conscience is heart. Uh, so what is the biblical definition of, a, of conscience? 
Uh, you have probably heard down through your life, let your conscience be your guide. You've heard that, haven't you? And, well, I don't know that I would completely disagree with that statement, as long as I could preface it to say that if your conscience is being fed by the Word of God, then you could have uh, a great help to you through your conscience. But that's not always the case. It's not always the case with us. It's not always the case with other people who may use that motto or that phrase. There are people who let their conscience be their guide and they don't believe in God. <laughs> what good would your conscience be? So we're going to do a study, and I think it's a very interesting one. I trust it will be to you as well. What is the biblical definition of a conscience? And then, obviously, we want to try to apply it. What does the conscience have to do with our context in 1 John chapter 3? So those are the, three que are the two questions um, that I would like to try to answer this morning for you. I'm going to read, and we are going to be turning to a few portions of Scripture here that use this word, this Greek word, um, sunido. Sunido is the word, Greek word for conscience. As I read from a number of different commentators, you will hear these illustrations come up. That the conscience is like nerves to a body. What good would... Would the body be if it didn't have any nerves to say, oh, that feels bad or oh, that feels good? If your hand was on something that was burning and you didn't have any, uh, you didn't have any nerves at the end of your hand. Uh, a red light on the dashboard. How many of you ignore the red light on the dashboard? I do sometimes. That comes up, oh man, I don't want to go take, get mess with that. Window to a house, that's an interesting one. That will be used by one of the commentators. Uh, weighing scales, or the, the scales of justice. The fact that you are balanced. And then an internal court. These are all used by commentators on what the conscience is. Uh, by the way, and... Uh, Lois, I have uh, Lois uh, Stewart. I have very sweet memories of uh, going to your father's house, your father and mother's house, and your dad didn't lend books out. And so I would have to go and read books at his house. And so I, I had a, uh, my first uh, theology uh, lessons were at his house, and I, I, he gave me his commentaries to read his uh, systematic theologies. And one of the first things that systematic theology teaches you is the argument for the existence of God. And what we're actually going to go over this morning, this is kind of, you know, I'm trying to be fancy here. What we're actually going to go over here is the anthropological argument for the existence of God. The fact that you know right and wrong is proof that there is a God. And that's one of the first things you learn in your theology courses, in systematic theology. You have to, you have to learn, you know, and there's cosmological and theological, uh, teleological, and there's a couple more, and I never did really grasp them as much as I, I should, but uh, I did go back, now that I have my own systematic theologies, I did go back this week, and I read the anthropological argument for the existence of God. The fact that you have feelings, the fact that you know right from wrong, and every person knows right from wrong to one extent or another, is proof that God exists. The fact that you have a conscience proves that God exists. That's free. I'm not even going to charge you for that this morning. Conscience. The Greek word means to see completely, 
respectively, meaning to understand or become aware, to, to be conscious of or informed of, and used in the King James to consider to know, to be privy to, be aware. I liked Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary on his definition of conscience more than most of the other dictionaries. It says, a person's inner awareness of conforming to the will of God or departing from it, resulting in either a sense of approval or condemnation. I think that's an excellent illustration or an excellent uh, way to say what the conscience is. But now I need to prove that to you biblically, right? I mean, because these are beautiful words, and, uh, but, but I need to be able to back this up with Scripture. And so that's what we're going to do for the next few moments. I got a lot of verses, don't I? Is that okay with you? You have a lot of verses, huh? Okay. So you can be turning to these uh, um, in anticipation to what I am reading to you. And obviously they are not in uh, biblical order here because we're going from 1 Timothy to 1 Timothy. And so, but these are in order of what I'm going to be reading to you. Okay? So would you just uh, bear with me a little bit? Uh, the conscience may be compared to weighing scales. We can think of a conscience as a scale of self-judgment. We need to weigh our actions and our words and our deeds. And before we speak or act, we need to make a judgment. Is this right or wrong? Is this good or evil? Should I or should I not? Also, after we act or speak, the conscience makes a judgment. Was it right or wrong? Should I have done this or not? To get the right answer, we must have the accurate scale. God has given the man the capacity and, or ability to know when he has sinned or when he has done right. Every person has a certain awareness or sense of what is wrong and what is, uh, excuse me, what is right and what is wrong. This is something that God has built into man for man's good. When God created man, he gave him a conscience. No other creation on the face of the earth I know that you may think that your sweet little dog has a conscience, but it doesn't. There's no way that anybody thinks that a cat has a conscience. No animal has a conscience. Now, it may react to the way that you have trained it, the way you speak to it, but that's not having a conscience. That's different. God wants man to know when things are not right in his life so that man might fix it whatever's wrong. When man sins or does wrong, God wants him to feel bad about it and feel guilty about it. If man felt good about sin, then man would never want to get the problem fixed. God also wants us to know when things are not right with our souls. This is why God has given man a conscience. The conscience is to the soul what nerves are to the body. The conscience lets us know when things are not right. When we sin, the conscience triggers bad feelings. The word conscience simply means to know with. And it is used some 30 times in the New Testament. Conscience is the internal court where our actions are judged and are either approved or condemned. Now, Lord willing, you're already in Romans chapter 2. Let's read Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature. God created them. He gave them a conscience. The things that are contained in the law, these having not the law, are laws, are a law unto themselves. 
which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the mean while accusing or, uh, or excusing one another. Do you remember when Abraham allowed Sarah to get too close to king, the king? Because Abraham had lied and said, she was my sister. When the king figured it out on his own that uh, those two people are married, he had a problem with it, didn't he? He went to Abraham and he said, why didn't you tell me that she was, my, she was your wife? Abraham said, well, I was scared. Why didn't this heathen king just essentially just do what he wanted? Because the law was written in his heart. Thou shalt not commit adultery. The law was already there. The conscience was already there. Do you know that the Bible says that nature itself teaches us that if a man have long hair, it is a shame to him? That's what the Bible says. You see these men who go around and they have long hair. Each one of them has a conscience. Should they have long hair? No, long hair is for women. They should be listening. If, if, if no one else was to ever say anything to them about having long hair, if they were listening to their conscience. Conscience is not the law. And uh, by the way, you can now turn to Titus 1.15 if you'd like. We'll be there in just a moment. Conscience is not the law. It bears witness to God's moral law. But the important thing is this. Conscience depends on knowledge. The more spiritual knowledge we know and act on, the stronger the conscience will become. Did you hear that? The more spiritual knowledge we know and act on, the stronger the conscience will become. I may remind you that we can have a weak conscience. Romans 14, meat-eating and not meat-eating. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 and 10 eating meats that's offered to idols. Paul was very specific that there were people who had strong consciences, consciences, yeah, say that, and also weak consciences. Conscience is that inner facility that knows with our spirit and improves when we do right, but accuses us when we do wrong. Conscience is not the law of God, but it bears witness to the law. It is the window that lets the light in. I thought that was an interesting illustration. The conscience is the window that lets the light in. If the window gets dirty because we disobey, then the light becomes dimmer and dimmer. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. The window gets dirtier and dirtier until light can't enter. This leads to a defiled conscience. Titus chapter 1 verse 15. It says, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their minds and conscience is defiled. Uh, you can turn, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. So, first of all, your conscience gets defiled. The second step is that your conscience gets seared. A seared conscience is one that has been so sinned against, it no longer is sensitive to what is right and wrong. I fear that that's the society in which we live in today. That we have passed the defiled conscience 
As I've mentioned, I think I mentioned last week that um, we now have legislators who are trying to legalize pedophilia. I think we've gone past the defiled conscience state and now we're to the seared conscience. 1 Timothy chapter 4, let's read verses 1 and 2. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, and I believe we're living in him, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisies, and then what does it say? Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Would you please then turn very quickly here to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. So we start with a defiled conscience. We start uh, not allowing the light of God's word into our conscience. After a while, our consciences become seared. They, they become burned so that to, they're cauterized, I think, is the actual medical term for this searing but there is one last step in the conscience. It is even possible for the conscience to be so poisoned that it proves things that are bad and accuses them, uh, excuse me, and accuses when the person does good. The Bible calls this an evil conscience. Hebrews chapter 10, that's where you're at. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart of full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Yes, we are in a time in our nation and even in our churches where I believe we have evil consciences. I heard someone not too long ago who claims to be a Christian. And this person was uh, promoting abortion. Acts chapter 24 verse 16 will be our next verse in just a moment. Again, I stress that conscience depends on knowledge. The light coming through the window. As a believer studies the word of God, he better understands the will of God and his conscience becomes more sensitive to right and wrong. A good conscience is one that accuses when we think or do wrong and approves when we do right. It takes exercise to keep the conscience strong and pure. And the Apostle Paul says, Acts chapter 24, verse 16 says, And herein I do exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and towards men. It takes exercise. We got to clean those windows. We've got to clean the windows so much to allow as much light in as we can. If we do not grow in spiritual knowledge and obedience, we have weak consciences. I've already mentioned that. How does a good conscience help a believer in times of trial and, and, and opposition? For one thing, it fortifies him with courage because he knows he's right with God and man. That's really going to be the summary of this whole study this morning. Do we know we're right with God and man? So that he need not be afraid. April 18th, 1521, just a few years ago. Martin Luther walked up to some doors and nailed a thesis on that door, the Edict of Worms. This is what he said. 
here I stand I can do no other God help me amen that's all he said he understood what he was up against the Roman Catholic Church but he knew he was right didn't he and it did not matter to him the consequences why well he had the light of God's Word but he also had a pure conscience didn't he his conscience bound to God's Word gave him the courage to defy the church okay um, I'll be a mi I'll be just a, a few seconds but uh, the next portion we're going to look at is first Peter chapter 3 if you'd like to turn there as I read a good conscience also gives us peace in our hearts when we have peace within we can face battles without the restlessness of an uneasy conscience divides the heart and drains the strength of a person so that he is unable to function at his best how can we uh, boldly witness for Christ if our conscience is witnessing against us a good conscience removes us uh, removes from us the fear of what other people may know about us say against us or do to us when Christ is Lord and we fear only him we need not fear threats opinions actions of our enemies David said, the, so the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. Psalm 118.6 We remember the Apostle Peter when he denied the Lord. He did not necessarily have the strongest conscience. But we know that Peter grew in the, Lord, in the Lord, didn't he? Peter made it clear that conscience alone is not the test of what is right and wrong. I cannot stress that enough. I have uh, in my mind this question, and I think I've answered it through this study. Can a conscience keep you from sinning? And my answer to myself is no. It may be able to keep you from doing wrong sometimes, but it's not supernatural. It cannot keep you from sinning. Peter made it clear that conscience alone is not, enough, is not the, the test of what is right and wrong. A person can be involved in either well-doing or evil-doing. For a person to disobey God's word and claim it is right simply because his conscience does not convict him is to admit that something is radically wrong with his conscience. Conscience is a safe guide only when the Word of God is the teacher. If we are to maintain a good conscience, we must deal with sin in our lives and confess it immediately. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the exercising of our faith. It's keeping the window clean so that the light can come in. So that we can have a, a good and pure conscience. We must also spend time in the Word of God. A strong conscience is the result of obedience based upon knowledge. And a strong conscience makes for a strong Christian witness to the lost. It also gives us strength in times of persecution and difficulty. 1 Peter chapter 3. Now... In verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. That whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, that ye may be ashamed that uh, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. 
For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Wouldn't be hard of a stretch to, for us to say that if we do wrong, we deserve what we get. But when we're doing right and we are rewarded with wrong, which can happen, the cross maybe would be a good example of that. But we know that our Lord Jesus Christ had a pure conscience, didn't he? As times of difficulty come to the church, we must cultivate Christian love. For we will need another, one another's help and encouragement as never before. We must, we must also maintain a good conscience because a good conscience makes for a strong backbone and a courageous witness. The secret is to pr practice the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If we fear God, we need not fear man. Samuel Johnson said, Shame arises from the fear of men, conscience from the fear of God. I thank the Lord for those commentators and uh, what they had to say. It helped me quite a bit. We have a few more verses that I would like to read um, and we'll just read them in succession here. First of all, 1 Timothy chapter 1 now. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. These are just verses that I would like for you to grasp and have in mind about conscience. First, First Timothy chapter 1 Verse 5, hey, are you surprised at how, how much the Bible has to say about a conscience? Huh? And this isn't even half of the verses. Like I said, I think it's mentioned at least, it's over 30 times. 1 Timothy 1, 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Skip down to verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on, on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning the faith made shipwreck, of whom is Hymeletus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Here is a good and a bad example, a positive and a negative. Timothy being charged by his father in the faith to be strong, to, to war the good warfare. You've got to have a good conscience to do it. And now we have these two men, Hymeletus and Alexander, who Paul says blaspheme, and he actually turned them over to Satan. All right, First uh, Peter chapter three. I'm sorry, that's not correct on the screen. First Timothy chapter three, verse nine. Uh, actually, that. That is right. I'm sorry. I missed this one here. Chapter 3, verse 9. I'm sorry. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9. I'll give you a second to get there. It says, Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Now, if you will, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. Then we have a few in Hebrews, and we will try to get to some illustrations of what a conscience is and how it's used. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. I thank God, whom I serve from my fourth fathers with a pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Wow. 
I don't know if I can say that. I'm not sure that my conscience is as pure as the Apostle Paul's. Let's turn to the two portions in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 9.14 is the first one. I don't know if some of you may be blocked from the screen over here that are on the west side. Hebrews 9.14, this is a verse that we read each time we celebrate the Lord's table. It says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve a living God? What a verse. Can you think of that person who has lived a life of sinfulness and they're so entrenched in sinfulness and then one day they receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior? What has happened to their conscience? Well, the Bible says that it's been purged. Uh, it's been purged, excuse me. And it's been purged from dead works to ser serve a living God. Think about the Apostle Paul, the one who possibly wrote these verses. Think about all of the sin that the Apostle Paul committed against the church. And then one day he received Christ as his Savior and his conscience was purged. Wow. One more verse, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18. Hebrews chapter 13. The writer of Hebrews, and I don't know if it's the Apostle Paul. I want to make that clear. The writer of Hebrews says, pray for us. For we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. It's a tremendous study, isn't it? To think about our conscience. What God has given us. And again, it's not the standard for right and wrong. Please. The word of God is the standard for right and wrong. But the more that we allow the word of God to come into our conscience, the stronger, I almost said gooder, the, the, the good, uh, the, the, the purer our conscience can be. Um, I got a couple of examples for you. Um, turn with me to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, we're going to go all the way back. Um, at this time, while you're turning, I'm going to ask you for your prayers, as I have done in the past few messages, uh, on leading, on where to go next. One of the places that intrigues me is the dispensation of conscience. The dispensation of conscience. And so I have just a, a little quiz for you. I should have put it up on the screen, but I don't. Who are the three men that are highlighted in the dispensation of conscience? That's a quiz. Who are the three men that are highlighted? And I'm even going to cheat. I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint here. It's in the book of Hebrews. And I'll even give you the chapter. It's chapter 11. Okay. But don't cheat. Don't look now. We've got too much more to go over. Genesis chapter 4 is the... Story of Cain and Abel, isn't it? When did the dispensation of conscience begin? The moment that Adam ate or partook of the fruit. The dispensation of conscience began. So let's just go back there in our minds. I, can't, I don't have time to, to read that portion of Scripture. But do you find the... Uh, example of a conscience in Adam and Eve they partook of the fruit and what happened immediately after that immediately they knew that they were naked so what did they do they sewed fig leaves together that was the best that their conscience could do and then when they heard the voice of the Lord what did they do? 
They hid. That was, that is an excellent illustration of the conscience. But we're in Genesis chapter 4. We're now the sec second generation here. Let's start in verse 1. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought the first thing of the flock of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect, and Cain was very wroth. Why? The conscience. And his countenance fell. The Lord now knows, and so he's trying to help Cain, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If you bring me what I have commanded you to bring me as an offering, won't you be accepted? If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his, shall sin you shall be sin's desire, essentially. And thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Why? Well, we know that First John says very clearly, and I'll read it for you. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, who slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil. How did Cain know that his own works were evil? It was his conscience. There's no doubt that mom and dad had taught him the right way. I don't have any doubt about that. But we're, we're watching the conscience at work here in the life of Cain. Verse 9, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? Have you ever been in a bad mood because of something that you did sinfully? Oh, I don't want to replace the Spirit of God this morning. There's no doubt that the Spirit of God is convicting us and, and prodding us when, when we sin, but we also have a conscience. Am I my brother's keeper? I just have a real quick commentary on that. I thought this was excellent. excellent. Cain was a very religious man. Contrary to com common belief, Cain was very conscious of his duty toward God and the need of doing something to please the Almighty. When we speak of Cain, we immediately think of him as a murderer. But the sin of murder was a result of Cain's wrong religion, and I add, and the conditioning of his conscience. Let me repeat, Cain was very, very religious. In the process of time, Cain brought forth from the ground an offering unto the Lord. Verse 3. Notice three things here. Cain was the first one to think of bringing a sacrifice. Cain brought an offering. And third, we are told that he brought it unto the Lord. It was an act of worship as part of Cain's religion. Cain had deep convictions concerning man's duty toward God and the need of an offering but all of his convictions and all of his sincerity did not avail him one bit as long as he rejected the provisions God had laid down for an acceptable sacrifice. There are many good points from the religious standpoint about the offering of Cain. He did, deny, he did not deny the existence of God. He recognized that when he brought an offering, it was to the Lord. 
Cain was not an atheist. He also believed in the need of salvation, for he brought his offering. And yet, all of it was of no avail. Cain was religious, sincere, ambitious, zealous. But he did not believe what God meant what he said. He ignored the word of God and chose to put his own interpretation upon what God had said. So let me repeat. He denied the absolute and an inerrant authority of the word of God. He took what he wanted and placed his own interpretation upon the rest. He was full of, he was a full-fledged modernist. He did not cast the whole word of God aside. Oh no, not that. But he twisted it to suit his own philosophy. Of all of the infidels, please catch this. Of all of the infidels, the worst and most dangerous men, is not the man who openly and blatantly rejects the word of God and throws it out completely. But the worst of all deceivers is the one who uses pious language and is very religious and moralizes from the Bible and uses fundamental termolo terminology. And while he carefully rejects the blood, the deity, the resurrection, and the truth of grace, poison is all the more dangerous when it is sugar-coated, and error is all the more dangerous when it is coated with a religious and pious Phra phraseology. So we've answered, I think, the first part. At least we've given a biblical definition of what a conscience is. But now, what does it mean to our text? Would you turn, or I, I actually have it up on the screen if you don't want to turn, but 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. You know how I, I can talk for just, I've only been up here for like 15 minutes, right? I can speak for hours, and then you just find that one verse that just says what you've said for two hours. I know it feels like two hours to you, but it hasn't been that long. Are we people who truly love the brethren with a pure and good conscience? That's the, the question before us, I believe, from the context of 1 John chapter 3. The Apostle Paul says in verse 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you, Word. That's a wonderful verse. That, that sums up everything that I've been trying to say for the past hour or so. Since we have now successfully defined what true biblical love is in our study of Hosea, let us now see if we are practicing true biblical love to the brethren. If we are not, then we are not loving the Lord the way we should. You can't be in a right relationship with the Lord if you are not in a right relationship with, with everyone around you. I would like to clarify that statement as we go forward through the next few weeks. No matter what a person says about you, feels towards you, or does to you, you can love them Biblically. Biblically. We should be striving to love the brethren and to, to have a love for even our enemies. So I have, I think, a, an illustration. This was in Way of Life, Friday Church News of this week. Um, Rick Warren is one of the most famous pastors, maybe if not uh, him and Joel Osteen, the two most famous pastors of, uh, of our generation. He pastors Saddlebrook Church. And he announced 
on Instagram that he ordained three female pastors. Yesterday was a historic night for Saddlebrook Church in many ways. We ordained our first three women pastors, and he gives their names. Saddlebrook Church is the second largest in the Southern Baptist Convention. It's called by Christianity Today America's most influential pastor. His influence is vast. But is he loving biblically? Is he creating his, his own doctrines? I believe that he is. I don't know that he understands what true biblical love is. Rick Warren's influence is past. It reaches into every sphere of Christianity, from Catholicism to Mormonism to liberal Protestantism to evangelicalism and even to fundamental Baptists. Warren has been called America's pastor, and it is for good reason. He is so shallow in his teaching, so positive in his approach, slow sliding of repentance, so neglecting of unpopular doctrines such as hell, judgment, and separation, so tolerant of heresies, so enthusiastic of rock music, so soft-spoken on the subject of worldliness, that apostate America cannot help but love him. But is he truly loving the brethren? Are we? As we go forward in this study, the question that I would simply like to ask is, are we in a right relationship with everyone around us? I believe, and this is where I covet your prayers, I believe we're going to look at the church of Corinth. Because there we'll find the Apostle Paul in a wonderful relationship with everyone. We'll find him turning people over to Satan. Won't we? Is that loving? It is. It's true, biblical, agape love. We'll find him encouraging those who need to be encouraged. We'll find him defending himself against uh, uh, those who were trying to defraud him. We'll find him in, in, in many different areas. But he was, he was one who truly loved and had a love for the brethren. Do we? We say we love the Lord. Well, one of the ways, especially in 1 John chapter 3, that we must prove it is through the love of the brethren. Can we have a good and pure conscience toward everyone? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you again for the time that you have given us in your wonderful word. Again, Father, I pray that this was a sweet-smelling savory to your holy nostrils. We certainly want to be in a right relationship with you. And so, Father, we want, as is stressed in 1 John chapter 3, that we are in a right relationship with everyone around us. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that the Son of God was manifested to us. Ask, Father, that as we go through this week, that our consciences would be cleaned through the Word of God. Sanctify us wholly. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.